You are watching Life on Gabriela TV, community television for you, by you. Hi, I'm Althea from Life on Gabriela TV. I'm here today with Sheila Malcolmson. MLA of Nanaimo, and we're here today to talk about the healthcare situation in BC, focusing on the central Vancouver Island area. Thank you so much for coming here today. Thank you for inviting me. Now, let's do a little bit of recap from August of last year. Healthcare workers are still overworked, and the majority of hospitals are understaffed. Nearly about a million of people in BC don't have a family doctor. Even some of them are sent overseas for specialized treatment. How did we get here? Oh, it is such a hard time, right? Mm -hmm. We already had a system where people were reaching out for help sometimes and not being able to get it as quick as they wanted. Um, already coming out of a time where there had been a lot of defunding of healthcare and related services in British Columbia. And as a new government in 2017, we were working really hard to repair some damage, build things back up, uh, bring workers who had been privatized out of the healthcare system back in, big plans, uh, and then the pandemic hit and just revealed so many weaknesses in our system, from addiction care right up to long-term care. Uh, and you know, the things that revealed were true, that there were, we're putting a whole lot on our frontline workers, uh, as a province and a country, we hadn't trained as many new healthcare workers as we needed. Uh, and the pressures of the pandemic just, you know, put everybody under strain. Patients, families, workers. And so big picture, uh, we're continuing to build more hospitals, to add more seats for training to our universities, uh, increasing pay. Uh, finding new ways to pay family doctors and give that incentive. You can't tell a doctor where it is or what to practice, but we can give incentives and had pretty good success in the last year of a new payment model for family doctors. We gave nurse practitioners scope of practice, which had always been resisted in BC. They can do everything a doctor can do except for surgery for the most part. So in many cases, they're great family uh, medicine providers. Uh, we've expanded mental health and addictions treatment. We brought long-term care homes back up to the standards that were set. They were all failing before. Uh, and we're building new long-term care facilities. And despite all that, uh, we've got aging population. We've got a lot of healthcare needs that got neglected during uh, the time of the pandemic where people weren't diagnosed early on cancers, for example. Uh, and a huge increase in population. And so it's a real rising tide. Even though we've added a lot of services, um, there's more demand again and again. So we have to continue to do more and that's, that's work we're doing. Mm -hmm. Now, on July 5th, 2023, Vancouver Sun published an article titled, titled BC Expands Family Doctor Registry, but critics say it's just one more wait list. Mm -hmm. Now in the article, Health Minister Adrian Dix said that 895,000 people in the province are still without a family doctor. Mm -hmm. And somehow nobody seemed to know if the number has changed since then. Do you mm -hmm. have this information? Mm -hmm. There was a new status report just a week ago that Adrian Dix uh, put out. Um, he has a computer mind that allows him to recite stats in an incredible way. Um, and I don't have... Uh, I don't have Adrian Dick's mind. Um, I do know that 50,000 people have been connected with a, a primary health care provider, doctor or nurse practitioner um, in the year since that model was expanded, uh, which is a big step forward. Um, we also had 250,000 new people come to BC in just the last two years. Uh, so we continue to expand again and again. This new incentive that we provided a year ago to get family doctors to, to um, be compensated in a new way as an incentive has resulted in 4,000 new registrations, which is great. Um, that, and it's a 16% increase in the number of family practice uh, practitioners 
that have been rolled since then. 11% uh, increase of nurse practitioners just in this last year. Uh, and so we really encourage people, even though many people have been waiting much too long a time and it's frustrating. It's the number one thing I hear at my constituency office in Nanaimo, people wanting to be connected with family care provider. Uh, but if you do get on the registry, for one, it helps me as Nanaimo's member of the legislature know exactly how many people are still waiting. And we really do see a lot of progress of people getting added. We're building a new medical school. Uh, we're finding ways uh, to work with the universities um, to get people thinking about coming into, uh, into family practice. Um, and we've also just done a first in the country, finally just saying to the um, College of Physicians and Surgeons and the College of Nurses that um, their self-regulation, where they are the ones that get to decide uh, whether somebody with foreign trained credentials, it makes them um, legit to practice in British Columbia. We finally said to them, we're just impatient with how slow you make this process. Um, and so both for foreign trained nurses and for foreign trained doctors, we have um, re reduced by half the time that it might take them to qualify, um, removed some of the really quite punitive barriers um, around uh, language lessons that were unnecessarily layered on top of each other. Um, and so, you know, if it goes as we hope, um, then, you know, no longer will people be taking a taxi ride and finding out that their driver is actually a doctor qualified to practice medicine in another country, but not allowed to in British Columbia. Um, that's a, a terrible outcome for that person. Uh, and of course, for our healthcare system. And so, Always keeping patient safety in the front, um, we are removing barriers in that side of, of the, the roadblocks that people have had to get a family doctor. Um, and I don't want any of this to sound like bragging because we're trying a lot of different things in new ways, but still there are a lot of people not served by a family doctor and, uh, and that's unacceptable. It's bad for health, it's bad for connection to so many other services. And so we're really continuing to press to do more. Mm -hmm. You mentioned about uh, medical school. And mm -hmm. when is that? Oh, mm -hmm. where is it located, and when is it available for other people to? Yeah, it's not on Vancouver Island. <laughs> That's the one thing I can say. Uh, it's something that we're going to do with Simon Fraser University, and uh, the health minister has spoken about this. It's not in my area of representation, but I know it's one of those other you know pieces of hope for people. Mm -hmm. Do you think that we might get medical school sometime in Vancouver Island in the future? Um, I think Vancouver Island University would like to have that, but it's not something that is in the government's plans at this point. We've got so many things we need to do. Uh, and so building a hospital in, new hospital in Cowichan is one thing that is underway right now. Uh, building a new hospital um, in uh, Comox, also a, a big project of ours. And then more locally, the kind of construction that we're doing um, that we have underway is building a new cancer center for uh, Nanaimo Hospital and also building a 300 bed long term care home that would serve our whole region, but would be based in Lanceville. Those are the capital projects that we have underway in this area right now. And maybe if we get all that work done, then we can talk about training more uh, nurses and doctors uh, locally as well. Mm -hmm. And based on the information provided by the HealthLink website, um, they mentioned on the page for about the Health Connect um, registry. Uh, while local efforts to attract new family doctors and nurse uh, practitioner, practitioners are underway, we are currently experiencing a shortage in Nanaimo. Is there a particular problem in Nanaimo? Mm -hmm. Nanaimo um, has been challenged with um, housing affordability lately in a way that it didn't used to. As people have moved out of other higher cost areas like Vancouver, then we've had a lot of pressures on housing. That certainly has an impact on recruiting people of any, um, of any type um, of, of professional credentials, um, let alone their spouses. You know, it always has to be a family decision to move to a new area. Uh, I do know that Nanaimo Regional Hospital has a really good reputation among the in the residency program. They're unique in the hospitals in British Columbia in that they really work hard to have their resident doctors 
Um, that's someone that's finished their school-based training, but then they have the years of being a resident before they actually become a full independent practicing doctor. Uh, at um, NRGH, they rotate their residents through every area of practice. And so there's real um, cachet to that. Um, the, the top of the line residents will apply to come to Nanaimo because they really want to have that, that opportunity. Um, and the retention rate of those residents um, then having had their years in Nanaimo and having a good experience then choosing to settle here is also very high. So we have a lot of optimism about um, based on, on attracting um, really good resident doctors that they will want to stay and that that will add to the pool. Uh, but we have an aging population like so many places, so we've had a lot of retirements. Nanaimo's recruitment has been exceptional of new family doctors. The Division of Family Practice works very hard uh, to um, identify gaps coming up in the future, but also to do a full court press on, on um, courting new doctors to come into the area. The same as we've seen on Gabriola, that um, the community and, um, and other doctors have worked really hard to attract new family doctors to practice in our clinic here. Same thing is happening in Nanaimo through the Division of Family Practice. Um, and when I see their numbers, they're very impressive. But the thing we're feeling is the number of retirements. And so that's the challenge that Nanaimo has. We're the fifth fastest growing community in the whole country. So there's more demand for doctors. Um, and despite very high uh, recruitment and new doctors coming to practice in Nanaimo, we've had an exceptional number of retirements. And so we have to continue uh, to train more doctors, to remove barriers to foreign practice, and then um, to really tell a good story about how our region is an exceptional place for doctors to come and practice and raise their families. You know, piece by piece, um, you know, we're really trying to draw on the best advice that we're getting um, from people on the front line. We're um, trying to find ways for the people that do have a lot of experience working in healthcare to both draw their advice out, but also to just plead with them, don't retire too early. We've built in um, both for long-term care workers and frontline healthcare workers, uh, mental health supports and a, uh, an online system of counseling and connection to resources to, that, that were built by their peers, built by them, um, so that we can help them um, uh, you know, contend with the real stresses of the job and just pleading with them, stay in your position while we're training up new people that are brand new. You know, there's some, you know, I have a friend on Gabriola who graduated from NDSS went in um, to be uh, working as a licensed practical nurse, trained at VIU, um, and she's doing highly responsible jobs now as a brand new graduate, both in long-term care and now, now working in the hospital. Um, so we really recognize the wisdom of people that have been there for a while. You know, pairing with the brand new workers that are out there um, is really necessary so that the, the new workers we're training, um, that they can soak up all the mentorship and wisdom of, um, of the elders that have been doing this work for a longer time. Um, those are all things that we have to, you know, while we're just trying to keep the system together and build it out at the same time, always keeping the people that are doing the work, you know, front of mind. Since COVID, virtual appointments have become more and more, let's say, common. And mm -hmm. perhaps it might mm, seem that that option tends to be more convenient for some people with limited access, as this allows them to not always rely on walk-in clinics or emergencies. Uh, mm -hmm. Will this influence or prolong the, the effort to gather more healthcare providers? Mm. Doing virtual care is especially uh, important when we're having uh, challenges getting access to medical specialists. Um, and then some of the really interesting remote technology, like to be able to read a photo of um, a mole in somebody's skin to be able to identify whether um, it might be cancerous, that rather than simply relying on what resources are available locally, we can use highly specialized uh, diagnostic techniques um, in a way that makes all the sense in the world. It's not about the relationship that you have to have face to face. It's just about using the very best technology and getting answers to people um, as quickly as possible so that we can then settle on, on treatment for them, especially something so scary like a skin cancer. Um, but there's certainly a balance. Um, and that is something that I know the health minister is, 
is always thinking of we want um, if somebody cannot travel or cannot get the specialist, um, and especially if you're in northern BC, this would be most important to you that a, um, a video uh, appointment would be very important. But we also really don't want to have anything overlooked. And there's many cases where um, a physical exam is the thing that really has to happen. I think luckily for us in Nanaimo, we've got access to more specialists, more diagnostic equipment. We now, we changed some policies so that our MRIs run 24 hours a day. That didn't used to happen. Um, so we've been able to expand enormously um, diagnostic uh, um, timeline and not have as many waiting lists. Um, and so we're always gonna be doing that delicate dance, I think, between uh, using the technology, including virtual appointments, as well as um, the necessity of often um, being able to um, be in person and, and have the doctor able to um, really do a full assessment of where the person is. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people there would rather drive out of town to seek medical services, like in Parksville or Ladysmith, for example, because rather than waiting for hours in Nanaimo to have their services. Mm -hmm. Do you think this is the current best solution out there? Mm -hmm. I'm not familiar with the area that, that you're talking about. Um, I certainly know from experience here on Gabriola that it's been just a game changer for people to be able to, if they are transported in ambulance, to be able to go to the Gabriola Health Center, which was built by the community, for the community, to be able to get um, assessed by a doctor on call. You know, someone who comes out after hours and says, your ankle is sprained, not broken, you can go home. Or yes, definitely you need to be transported to hospital or if they're in a very dangerous situation to have them stabilized before transport. Um, that is, a, you know, especially for people that are new to Gabriola, to know how it was before the medical center was built here on the island. Um, you know, you would always be sent to town and in the middle of the night, the ferry would be called out or then when the ferry stopped refusing to transport people overnight, um, then to go out in the harbor patrol boat on a stretcher. You know, it's um, it's just so different to be able to have that extra care. And it's just such a credit to the um, people in the community that had that vision, that the way for us to recruit and retain doctors was to release them from the responsibility of owning their building and hiring their secretarial staff and dealing with um, all the mechanical things of the building. You know, and this is a model that we borrowed from other communities. North Pender Island, for example, was one that did that. The community not-for-profit looks after the structure and the doctors just focus on being doctors. Um, I have heard in response to your question about whether people might travel further to get care, um, that in communities that have a number of different um, urgent primary care centers or an urgent primary care center that's close to a hospital, you might be in the, in, um, uh, Victoria, for example, you might be waiting at Royal Jubilee in the emergency room. They would have a display saying, um, the wait here for you is going to be three hours, but the wait at the James Bay Urgent Primary Care Center is only 45 minutes. And then the family decides they're going to go and move over there. Um, so I've, I've heard of that kind of response. Um, we don't have that flexibility in our area yet. Uh, the Urgent Primary Care Center is oversubscribed every day. Um, Often you'll, you know, I'll walk by on my way to work and I'll see a sign saying, we'll next be taking patients at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. And it's only 10 o'clock in the morning today, you know, so that's a problem. We don't have the ability to try different places. Um, so that's, you know, our emergency room is, is really busy. My best friend is a um, social worker that looks after people um, in the Nanaimo emergency room. I know how long from her, how long people have to wait. And often the people that are coming to the emergency aren't actually in an emergency. Um, they're not gonna be admitted to hospital, but they're in some kind of a crisis and they do need some kind of help. And so she works really hard to navigate them to where her support is, but they won't be admitted to hospital. Um, so, you know, we're continuing to, you know, same as libraries, you know, there are people going to libraries that need a warm place to stay during the day. And so the institution is evolving to um, recognize that people walking in the door have different needs and are there for different reasons than used to be in the past. Um, 
that's very difficult for people that are working in that emergency and, and very difficult for the people that are waiting, seeing more people coming in and more people coming in and being frustrated about how long they have to wait. Um, much better for us as a society and in a medical system to look after people's basic primary care um, and mental health, all the things in their life that mean they don't ever have to walk in in an emergency situation into the ER in the first place. And based on the situations over these past several years, do you think that the public health care system will continue to be the best way to do it? Are you confident about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, these you know, most fundamental of services um, shouldn't be inside a for-profit model. Um, and, and the collaboration that we see at a place like the Gabriola um, Healthcare Center or at the urgent primary care centers where you have a model of pharmacist is there, uh, a nurse practitioner, a doctor, a psychologist, a social worker, in some places a physio. I mean, there's really, um, to, to move beyond the idea that it's only the doctor that can help you and that especially at a time of scarcity of doctors, we need to keep them focused on the things that only they can do. Um, and so I think the model of working in partnership um, social worker, pharmacist, doctor, nurse, um, together. Um, and the ways that, for example, Gabriela Health Center has taken the pressure off doctors and made it easier to recruit and do their work. That is certainly the way of the future. I think if we hadn't had the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, I think we would have a clearer picture of how moving to that team-based medicine um, and working within primary care networks, which has been a real focus of our government across BC, and I've seen it work really well in Nanaimo, um, I think we would have seen a kind of a clearer path to having the, um, the promise of that team-based approach, you know, bear fully the fruit that we were hoping for. There have just been so many interruptions and so many premature retirements and, and, such a, um, and so many exacerbated long-term health impacts from people that are still suffering from the impacts that it's, um, it's made the path a little bit less clear, uh, but it still feels really like the, like the right approach. And there's a lot of evidence that supports that. We've got in South Nanaimo, the first nurse practitioners clinic um, anywhere in British Columbia. And that's something that our government funded. Um, and I hear from uh, a lot of my friends that go there. It's just such a great place. They love the alternate approach. Um, that you don't, unless you're going into surgery, you don't always necessarily need to have a doctor that you see. Um, and they're really doing a lot of very innovative work with um, uh, prescribing medications for people that have addictions, um, really uh, broadening the scope of what can happen right within a, a, a primary healthcare clinic. And uh, Stanamo First Nation built their own healthcare center um, on reserve. That was also done in partnership with our provincial government. Um, that's a place that people can get um, trauma counseling, um, uh, nutrition help. Um, they've got an outreach worker that goes out and talks with indigenous people who are uh, living um, without homes and uh, encouraging them, keeping the link to healthcare, but reaching out to them in a really culturally informed way. So. We see a lot of innovation in the region, and uh, it gives me a lot of hope about when we um, don't take a, co a cookie cutter approach, but we really try to you know, tackle some of these really difficult problems in, um, in creative ways and ways that are really informed by the community. Um, then like we did on Gabriola, like Slanemo did on their own reserve, then um, I think we can learn, the whole system can learn from some of those successes. Uh, that's all I have to do for you today. Thank you so much for this interview. Yeah, thank you so much for diving so deep on this topic. <laughs> One additional note, the BC Ministry of Health recently announced that the number of family doctors practicing in the island health region had increased by 179 since the introduction of the government's new payment model. That brought the total to 954 and was the second largest rise in the province after the Vancouver Coastal Health region. How that will affect waitlists remains to be seen, 
but we'll be talking with frontline workers later in this series and we'll ask them if they're seeing any changes yet. Watch for that coming up.